All right. So I can get Mr. Rusty to throw up our our yeah PowerPoint. So we've been looking at the role of national Israel in God's plan and at various times in their history. And then we advance to this topic of the kingdom of God in relation to Jesus Christ. Because if, if um, um, Reformed theology basically advocates that we're already in the kingdom, well, let's see what Jesus had to say about the kingdom. And that's what we looked at last week. And I just want to just reiterate a couple of those real quickly. So we saw that in the early days of Jesus' ministry, he clearly was preaching the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. If it's in Matthew's gospel, it's usually the kingdom of heaven. If it's in Mark's gospel, it's the kingdom of God. In Luke's gospel, uh, when, with, together with the word gospel, it doesn't appear at all, nor does it appear in the book of John. But in Matthew and Mark... We have the gospel and the kingdom put together. Here he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so we see Jesus clearly is preaching and proclaiming the kingdom of heaven. No question about that. So we see in Mark's gospel, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So you can see how uh, some people would look at that and say, therefore, we're in the kingdom. I mean, Jesus was presenting it, right? And it gives that impression. But we need to be a little bit careful. There's a, there's a hermeneutical error called illegitimate totality transfer. <laughs> if you really want to dazzle, razzle, dazzle somebody, just throw out, oh, that's the, that's the classic error of illegitimate totality transfer. All it means is just because the word kingdom appears one place does not mean it means exactly the same thing everywhere it appears in the Bible. Or the word gospel, just because the word gospel appears does not mean it means does not mean that it means exactly the same thing everywhere you find it in the Bible. And so we need to be careful of that error or sometimes an analogy is used because when we think of the of a lion we normally think of that as a metaphor referring to Jesus any other? Satan. So depending on which passage you're looking at, the word lion is used in one passage, the metaphor referring to Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, or in 1 Peter, he's referred to, it's, it's a, an analogy of Satan. So just because the word lion is used doesn't mean you force it to mean the same thing everywhere in the Bible. It doesn't work that way. That would be the error of illegitimate totality transfer. So this word kingdom, some some. Uh, dispensationalists would say, therefore, we should never talk about the kingdom in the church age. Well, that to me is also an over-exaggeration. Look at Psalm 103, verse 19. The Lord has established His throne in heaven and His kingdom rules over all. So in a general sense, even before the millennial kingdom is established, we see that Scripture says that, that God is is king overall. So I have no problem singing a song about the king and referring to my Savior Jesus. I have no problem at all, okay? Because in a general sense, we are in his everlasting kingdom. But that's not the same thing as saying the millennial kingdom, the kingdom that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's a whole different thing, okay? So we need to just, we need to just think through a little bit that whole issue. So we, we went through the, some scriptures that indicated that the kingdom was postponed. And to, then we looked at a couple of the kingdom parables that come from Matthew chapter 25. And remember, last week we, we considered briefly Jesus' Olivet Dis Discourse. So he was, remember, he, he, he rides into the city and he's rejected as the Messiah, right? And as he's rejected as the Messiah... He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if only you would have known, right? But you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's a messianic phrase. So Jesus is making it clear that the kingdom is postponed because you've rejected your king. And immediately thereafter, the very next verse is Matthew chapter 24, verse 1, where the disciples then are, are asking Jesus, oh, look at these buildings. And he says, this is all coming down. And they say, well, when's that going to happen? And we talked about what kind of a question were they asking? Were they asking, were they thinking like Christians? Were they thinking like the, the fathers of the church? 
Or were they still thinking like Jews looking for their kingdom? And the answer is very simple. We know they were thinking like Jews looking for their kingdom because in Acts chapter 1, they were still asking, even after the crucifixion and resurrection, they're still asking the kingdom questions. So, so when Jesus answers their questions, their, their question is, kingdom, when's this going to happen? When are you coming to establish your kingdom? So he's answering their question. Therefore, Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, he's answering Jewish people who have kingdom questions, and that's what, he's, that's what he's answering, and we need to understand that when we read Matthew 24 and 25. We'd be, we'd be making a serious error to read into Matthew 24 and 25 the church, because that's not the question being asked, and that's not the answer being given. Now, so we looked at, we looked at the first two of the, of the parables in Matthew 25, which comes right after Matthew 24, and in those two parables, the parable of the ten virgins, and then the parable of the, of the talents, as we, as we look at those uh, parables, each one begins, like Matthew 25, verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins. And so he's, Jesus is making it very clear, he's talking about the kingdom. And we believe he's referring to the, the kingdom that they're still looking for, all right? The Jewish kingdom. And, and then in the second one of those, uh, the talents, uh, Matthew 25, verse 14, it starts out and he says, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man. So again, he's giving them parables relating to what the kingdom is going to be like. Okay? So he's answering their question with regard to what's coming. And then we come to the next parable that's in this sequence of three, which is Matthew 25, 31 to 46, what's often referred to as the sheeps and the goats judgment, all right? So if it's in the same context, he's just been telling them about the kingdom, all of a discourse, and then two parables in a row where he specifically says this is the kingdom, right? Kingdom of heaven is like, so what would we expect? Would we expect a sudden right turn or left turn and off to something else? No, we would expect he's still talking in the same, he's giving another illustration of the same principle, and he, he introduces. And so what, I want us to go through this point by point, just to think through what Jesus is saying and how this relates to what's coming, all right? So, Matthew 25, 31 to 33, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. All right. So, so here are the, the, the items that, that jump off the page. I, it's just as you go through it, these things are there. Uh, these are, this is the low-hanging fruit. First of all, what is the time that he gives us as to when whatever this is, this event, what is the time that he gives? When the Son of Man comes in His glory. Now, who's the Son of Man? Jesus. There's no question that's talking about Jesus. So, okay, He's, he's talking to them literally within five days, four to five days before the crucifixion. Okay? He says, when the Son of Man comes in His glory. Well, why would He have to come? He's already there. So He's going to be gone. He's going to be absent. He's talking about some time after his leaving that he will be coming. And how will he be coming? In his glory. As Mike said, he's not glorified yet. So he, when he comes, it will be a time when he's coming in his glory. And all the holy angels with him. Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. So the question is, has this already happened? Well, uh, of course, the, the Reformed theology would say, yes, it's just in heaven. It's figurative. But, but does, that, does that fit? Does that fit the... I mean, if Jesus is there talking to them and he's talking about when the Son of Man comes in his glory, does it, seem, does it, does it make sense that he would go to heaven and establish a kingdom in heaven but not here on earth? Does that fit with what he says in those words? I would submit it doesn't because the coming in his glory suggests he's coming here. I mean, normally when you say, I'm coming, 
You're talking about here. Well, we often in, in uh, literature or often in expressing ourselves say the wrong thing. Say, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to come to Roseville. No, you're not. You're going to go to Roseville. Come means here, right? And that's what Jesus said. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. In other words, not yet. Okay? Okay, so that would be the time when the Son of Man comes in his glory. What about the event? That's the next thing that we would want to see. What is this event that he's describing? And of course, I've tipped my hand by the title, but that's all right. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. What does that mean, all the nations? To what does that refer? Okay. Remember, he's speaking in a Jewish context. He's talking about everybody else. He's talking about everybody else. The nations, when, when you're a Jew and you talk about the nations, you're not talking about yourself. You're not talking about the Jewish nation. You're talking about everybody else. Okay? So, so <clears throat> he says, when all the nations will be gathered before him. So whatever this event is, it's going to be a gathering of all the nations. And then it says he's going to separate them one from another as the shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, before the go but the goats on the left. This is a judgment of the nations. Okay? So, well, that's what we want to try and understand, don't we? Okay? What is this judgment? How does this work? Uh, and and it's at some future point, Jesus is saying, at the time when he comes in his glory, when he's sitting on the throne of his glory. Okay, next we want to see who's the judge. Well, he tells us. Then the king, now he refers to himself as the king. The king will say to those on his right hand. Remember he just said that, that he was talking about the son of man coming. We know he's referring to himself because that's the way he frequently did. And now he says the same person that's coming to do that judgment is the king. Now Jesus is referring to himself as the king. But it's a future event that hasn't happened yet. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the, from the foundation of the world, and, and etc. So we see that the judge now is also the king. And it's Jesus Christ. Okay? That's, these, are, these are important details that we need to, to think about as we try seek to understand what he's, what he's telling his disciples about. So the next item you can see there is the inheritance. What is the inheritance for those who pass the, the, the judgment? And we'll look in a bit at the sentence for those who doesn't. It says, Then the, kingdom, the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, we could assume that he's talking about the kingdom in general, the kingdom of God in general. We could assume that. Except it seems to indicate that those who are alive and are participating in this judgment will be inheriting and going right into the kingdom, the very kingdom that he's been promising, but, and, and he being the king, and he's talking about coming to establish this, this in his glory when he comes with all the angels and comes in his glory. So you can see in a, in a very practical sense how it would make sense if indeed we're talking about a kingdom that will yet be established in the future, that Jesus will come and reign over on this earth. And so he says to these Gentile nations that have passed the test, and we're going to look at in a moment, what is the criteria? He's saying, inherit the kingdom. Okay. So the, 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 the benefit, the blessing that comes to them is that they will inherit the kingdom prepared for you from, from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me thirst food, and if I was thirsty and you gave me drink, and that's already moving on to the next thing, which is the criterion. What is the criterion for judgment? Okay, the criterion for judgment is exactly what he says there. And, and oh, I better back up and read. I skipped it and I shouldn't have. So I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me, Jesus says. And then he says, then the righteous will answer him and saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? What is implied in that answer of theirs? 
they didn't actually see Jesus, did they? So it was at a time when Jesus was not physically present. So they're saying, well, when did we see you physically present and, 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 and clothe you or, or, or minister to your needs? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Whoa, wait a minute. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was uh, in Bible college years and even seminary years, I looked at those verses and I'm going, that sounds like a works gospel. It sounds like that, that he doesn't say... The, 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 re, the reason that you're approved to go into the kingdom is because you believed in me. He doesn't say that, does he? Well, how, does, how can that possibly be? How can he say that the basis on which the criteria on which they're being judged is how they treated his servants? Is it a works-based gospel? Well, it turns out that actually all the way through Scripture... Genuine faith is evidenced by works. It's not that works is what accomplishes the salvation, but it is that the faith causes people to act in a certain way. We'll be talking about that later today with, with Mordecai. But in other words, when we have genuine faith, it's going to cause us to do things that we would not otherwise do, Right? We're, 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 we're going to be different. And so Jesus, but what is he talking about when he says, in, in, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren. Well, now let's back up and think about the context. If indeed Jesus in the Olivet Discourse is pointing forward to something that will happen to the Jews, and it's a point in the future, and he talks about the abomination of desolation, which has not happened yet, if indeed that happens during the tribulation period, the church is not in view at all. If indeed the pre, and I'm, I'm putting up ifs, I accept that. If indeed the church is raptured out first, and if you look on the back of your sheet, you can, you can get a heads up on a, you know what, I should have got one of those. I should have got a copy I can look at too. Oh, I, I'll have it on the screen here a little bit. It's okay. It's okay. You're fine. So, so we'll come back to that sheet in a moment, but if indeed the church gets raptured away, who are these inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren? Who would these brethren be? If, if indeed Jesus is talking about future time after the church is gone, it would be during the tribulation period, then who would these people be, the least of these his brethren? What Jews? Okay, I, we're, we're going to even become a little more specific. If we back up to chapter 24, Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. Well, how's that going to happen if the church is taken out? And oh, wait a minute. And we're going to look at this in detail in a few moments. It says the gospel of the kingdom will be preached. Well, during the tribulation period, that's the gospel of the kingdom. The, the gospel of the kingdom is the message that Jesus, the Messiah, is still coming and He's going to establish His kingdom. Oh, and so those who receive the message are looking forward to the kingdom being established on earth. And so that fits with what we're reading in, in, in Matthew 25. He's saying the sheep are the ones who receive that witness believe in Him, and they're going to go into the kingdom as the Gentiles, in addition to the, remember, the whole Jewish nation who survived to the end will go into the kingdom. That's what we read in Zechariah. Okay? That's what we read actually in, in Romans chapter 11. So the go this gospel of the kingdom will be preached, not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even though Jesus is the Messiah, it's going to be the gospel of the kingdom. But who's going to preach it? If the church is gone, who's going to preach it? Ah, the 144,000 referred to in the book of Revelation. Both in Revelation chapter 7, they're singled out that there will be 12,000 from each tribe of Israel, which is so interesting because 
If you don't have a national Israel, it's hard to come up with the 144,000 who will preach the gospel of the kingdom. Look at Revelation 14. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who, re- who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. First fruits. Think of this. The church is raptured away. Tribulation begins, and there are those who will come to faith amongst the Jewish people, 144,000 of them, and they will be the first fruits to God and to the Lamb, because when the tribulation ends, those who survive, because there's going to be a lot of Jewish people die during the tribulation period, those who die will go right into the kingdom, as will the Gentiles who come to faith because of these. Yes? I believe they will. Now, are they, are they Christians in the sense of the church? No, but they're believers in their Messiah. And so, what an interesting thing to, to, a concept. And so he says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So I'm quite intrigued by the the One for Israel uh, group in Israel that's producing all these video testimonies of the Jewish people who come to to faith in Messiah and Yeshua. Because I've, I've always wondered to myself, okay, if this is true, if the pre-trib rapture is true, the church gets raptured away, and you have these 144,000, how do they all of a sudden believe in Jesus? Because they're the ones that are preaching the gospel of the kingdom during the tribulation. How, how did 144,000 of them get saved just like that? Well, when the church is raptured away, the internet will still function, most likely. They will have the testimony of those who said, you know what? Jesus is the Messiah. Hello. Come on, Jewish people, wake up. And I have a suspicion that many of them will come to faith exactly like that. I also wonder to myself, how come you have 144,000 young people that have not gotten married? And I, you know, I thought, that's weird. You know, how, how, where are all these unmarried young people coming from? Look at culture today. Young people are not getting married like no other generation that's ever lived. All over the world this is happening. They're not getting married. Hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> just, just interesting curiosity, okay? Um, but in any case, so we have this description, the everlasting gospel will be preached, and that's right in the context of the 144,000. And they'll be preached to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So the message of the gospel of the kingdom will not only go to the Jewish people, it's going to go to all the peoples. And there will be those who will believe. And that makes sense when you come back to Matthew 25. And so you have this, this message that the, the, the king comes and he says, you know, you're in my right hand, you're going in, you're going to inherit the kingdom. Why? Because when, because you, when you treated, when you saw me in this needy condition and you took care of me, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the, the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. I believe he's referring to the 144,000 witnesses. And I'm not talking about Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> okay? I believe that's exactly what he's referring to. Because during that time, there will be tr- intense persecution against those 144,000. And so those who receive them and help meet their needs and care for them will be evidencing that they have ex- received their message of the gospel of the kingdom. Anybody have any questions? I mean, I'm not saying this is a hard and fast, but it's, it's interesting. Yes, Wayne? Yes. You can't really put, put a name on each of the 12 tribes and where they're at today and where, the, where those 12,000... But many of them know. As, as, as many, many, many of them, even though they're not in specific locations, they know what tribes they're from. There are those that don't, but you'd be amazed how many of them, just by their names. In many cases, by their names, they know. And by the way, um, there are the, uh, the Jewish people right now in Israel are very meticulous about 
finding out which tribe you're from and they're registering. You, you don't just say, I'm a Jew, I want to come to Israel. doesn't work that way. They want to know who you are, what's your bloodline, where are you from? So, uh, uh, but they, they will know. Remember, right now in Israel, there's 9 million people and about 7, 7 million of them are Jews. And they're sprouting like crazy. They're multiplying like crazy, okay? So 144,000 is not that big of a number, okay? All right, so then the sentence of those that are the goats. Then he also will say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now let me ask you this. We started out with who, what this event was. The event was the gathering of the nations. And the consequence for those who ha- do not believe are they're cursed and the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Has this happened? No. There's no way in the world that this has already happened. Has there been a judgment of the nations brought together and the one group is put over here in the right hand, or right hand, right hand, and goes into the kingdom and the other group goes into everlasting judgment? Has this happened? No. It remains to happen. So is it a whole group? Well, the, the, the criterion is based on the individual response from every nation, how they respond to the message of the gospel of the kingdom presented to them. The everlasting gospels it's referred to in the book of Revelation. Does that kind of make sense? I, I realize that, that th- these uh, prophetic statements are not always easy, they're not clear cut always, but when you put them together with the other prophetic statements, they, they begin to come together and make sense. This is an incredibly um, intense and complicated topic, and I, I believe it's important for us to have some, keep some humility and say this is our best estimate of what we believe is coming, not to have a, 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 an attitude of, oh, you other guys, you know, you're all wrong. I think that would be a big mistake. Um, but I believe that this really does make sense in the context of what Jesus, in, in the context of, okay, you're, you're not going to see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, so he's saying, until you receive me as your Messiah, mm-mm, no king, no kingdom. And then he begins to describe what's going to happen in the tribulation period, and then he describes what's going to happen at the end when he comes in his glory and comes as king. All right, so I want to move on to a very interesting topic that I had not thought much about before, but, and I kind of also tipped my hand on this last week, but wow, is this interesting to me. And that is the gospel declarations um, that we find in the New Testament. First of all, um, it's quite a buzzword right now in many churches. Uh, The word gospel has become an adjective rather than a noun. Many churches talk about gospel families, gospel church, gospel this, gospel that. And it can be used as an adjective, that's fine. But what does it mean? Well, the word is, okay, we have it in the word evangelism, eve evangelism. The angel part is like our word angel. It means messenger or message. And the e, EV is actually comes from Greek EU, which is good. It's the good message. It's the good news. That's all the word gospel in and of itself means. So you can have the gospel of, um, the gospel of health. You have good news about health. Okay. You can have, in other words, the word gospel in and of itself does not define what gospel it is. And we actually find out that Paul talks about, what are you doing? You, you're coming up with another gospel? So we know that the word in and of itself does not define what the message is. Okay. So let's, let's think about it. And as we already mentioned, we have this Jesus referred to the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, Matthew 4.23, he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. We get that. Okay. Jesus was preaching the gospel of the kingdom and seeming to indicate that it was right away, that it was coming. And, and then in Mark chapter 1, it says he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom and saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent. So he's preaching repentance and he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Okay? So, okay, we, we accept that that's what Jesus was doing. Now, we also remember that when Jesus sent out his disciples, he told them, do not go into the way of the Gentiles. 
And again, we, I always scratch my head, well, how come Jesus would tell them not to go into the way of the Gentiles? Why would he, why would he tell them to only go to the Jews? I mean, if, if the gospel is the gospel of salvation, isn't it for everybody? Yes, but they weren't preaching the gospel of salvation as we preach today. They were preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Does that make sense as to why now he would make that statement? You see how that makes, statement suddenly makes sense? He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom is a Jewish, primarily a Jewish thing. Gentiles will participate, but the, but the kingdom that's been promised is a Jewish thing. That's why you're taking the message, the gospel, the good news of the kingdom, and you're going to the Jewish nation because they're the ones to whom it applies. They're the ones who should receive the gospel of the kingdom. They're the ones who should receive Yeshua as their Messiah. Right? Okay. And so he says, and, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. It's kind of interesting that, that he commissioned them to do all this healing also in conjunction with, because in the kingdom that's described in Isaiah chapter 11 or described in the book of Revelation, it's a place where there's healing, there's no sickness. So what, doesn't it make sense that Jesus, in sending them out to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom of what's coming, that they would heal as a sign, as, a, as looking forward and saying, that's what's going to happen in the kingdom. That makes sense? Interesting, isn't it? Okay. So, but, now as we already looked, we came to this passage in his Olivet Discourse, where he's already said, okay, kingdom not now, because you've rejected your king. And yet he says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached at some point in the future. Oh, so when we look at that, are we to preach the gospel of the kingdom today? Well, that's a very interesting question. And first of all, we should understand that of the 17 times uh, that the word gospel occurs in the gospels in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of the 17 times that it occurs, the word gospel is put together with kingdom three times in the gospel of Matthew and two times in the gospel of Mark and does not appear once in Luke or John. Hmm, we have to ask ourselves. That's interesting. I wonder why not. Well, first of all, the gospel of Matthew is the gospel aimed at what people group? The Jews. So it does not come as a surprise that the gospel of the kingdom being preached is clearly presented in the gospel of Matthew. That doesn't surprise us at all. Nor does it surprise us in the gospel of Mark. Luke, the gospel of Luke, who did Luke say that he was writing to for in writing both the gospel and the book of Acts? Most excellent, Theophilus. Jewish? Greek, Greek. Ah, Luke in his gospel is recording everything to do with Jesus' life and ministry on earth more from a Gentile perspective. So he never mentions the gospel of the kingdom. Isn't that interesting? John doesn't mention it. John's writing from the perspective of uh, 20 years past the destruction of Jerusalem, or 10 years. So John's writing it from the perspective that the temple's already been destroyed. Jerusalem's already been destroyed. The kingdom is not going to be set up immediately. So you can see why he would not emphasize the gospel of the kingdom. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just, I find, these, I find these things to be so interesting once you put together the pieces and see how it fits. Now, Matthew 28. So Jesus has been crucified. He's been rejected as king. He's been crucified. He's risen from the dead. And he comes and he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Therefore, go preach the gospel of the kingdom. Does he say that? No. Even in Matthew's gospel, he doesn't say that. What does he say? Go, therefore, and make disciples. Well, that's not a kingdom message. Because there's been a giant change. The Jewish people were literally offered the kingdom, a totally bona fide, a legitimate offer. They rejected their king. Kingdom postponed. So now Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Did he explain all that was happening? Did he explain all about the church? No. No. 
He even told, tells them in John's gospel, you're not ready for some of this information yet. The Holy Spirit's going to reveal it to you. That's interesting. All right? So go, therefore, and make disciples, he says. And then in Mark 16, 15, he says, also, after the crucifixion and resurrection, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Wait a minute. Remember what he told, what he told the disciples when they went, sent out the 12? Go only to the lost tribes of the house of Israel. Don't go to the Gentiles. Now he's saying the opposite. He's saying, no, go to the whole world. Go to the nations. Go tell everyone. Oh, wow, the gospel has changed, hasn't it? And the answer is, yes, it has. So what is this gospel? How is it different? Well, so again, the word gospel means literally the good news. So in the beginning, Jesus told them to preach the good news of the kingdom. The kingdom was at hand. It's offered. It's here for you, you Jewish people. Will you receive your king and your kingdom? And the people from up north, they received it. They were willing, but the people from Jerusalem said nothing doing. They rejected their king, and so the kingdom is postponed. Now, so literally in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the word uh, gospel appears 13 times. And of those 13 times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, five times it's the gospel of the kingdom. Well, that's, uh, that's well over a third, Right? So in the Gospels, it's the gospel of the kingdom is at least a third of the times the word gospel even appears. Well, when you get from the book of Acts all the way to the book of Revelation, the word gospel appears 80 times, 8-0, 80 times. How many times from Acts to Revelation is it presented as the gospel of the kingdom? Not once. Not once. So it's... Something dramatic has changed. The gospel of the kingdom is no longer presented. So the question is, do we, are we presenting a different gospel than what, than what Jesus advocated at the beginning of his ministry? And the answer is yes. It's the gospel not of the kingdom. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Were you going to make a comment, Lisa? No. Okay. So uh, let's look at it scripturally. Because before I go to this, I just might mention that the gospel that's presented in the, from the book of Acts all the way through to Revelation is the gospel of God, the gospel of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of peace, the gospel of your salvation. My gospel, Paul calls it, but you never once see it as the gospel of the kingdom. Not once. So let's look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. What is the gospel? Okay? What is the good news? The gospel specifically preached to the church. Paul says, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you. Oh, so this defines what the gospel was when Paul went to Corinth. What was the message he preached to them? Did he preach to them, the kingdom is coming, prepare yourself. He said, the, the gospel that I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain... For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. And here it is. There's the gospel. That Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day. There is the gospel. He didn't say anything about the Messiah establishing His kingdom on earth, does He? That's what Jesus declared at the beginning of His ministry, but they rejected it. So the gospel... Am I laboring this point? I just, forgive me, but I've never heard this really emphasized in all my, what I, schooling that I took. It is in some older books on the topic, but it just jumped off the page when I started looking at the raw material of Scripture and looking at every use of the word gospel in the New Testament. And I realized the gospel that we preach today is not the gospel of the kingdom. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel of, a, of our, the fact that we're a sinner and Jesus died for our sins and that he was buried, that he rose again the third day and that he was seen by the 12 and Cephas and after that by over 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remained to the present. But some have fallen asleep after that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. So what is the gospel according to Paul, the gospel for the church? It's to do with Jesus, his death for our sins, his burial, his resurrection. That's the good news. 
It's a good news that we also have salvation that, that means that when we die, we don't just lay in the ground, that we have eternal life if we put our faith in Christ, right? That's the gospel. That's the good news. And that's the good news that made people so ecstatic throughout the Gentile world, even while the Jewish community, it, was, it just didn't make any sense to them because there was a blindness, wasn't there? And so they, they, they didn't see it. And so they, they weren't interested in this. They were looking for a king that would come and set up a kingdom earthly right then and there. And that didn't happen, so they weren't interested in Jesus. But the Gentile world starts hearing, wait a minute, Jesus died for my sins. He was buried. He rose again. We have eternal life because of that? That is good news. And so they received the gospel of Jesus Christ, not the gospel of the kingdom. So in this, in this book, uh, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians... Paul goes on, this is a prominent uh, chapter in the, in the Scripture, whenever we're doing a funeral, <laughs> you always go to 1 Corinthians 15, right? Because he's talking about the resurrection. He's talking about the fact that because Jesus rose, therefore we can have hope of our, our rising from the dead. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. You see, your faith is not in a kingdom that's coming. Your faith is in the resurrection. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead don't rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You, will, you are still in your sins. It has nothing to do with establishing a kingdom. The gospel for the church has to do with a risen Savior who died in our place. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. And so he is emphasizing the gospel has to do with the resurrection from the dead. It isn't about the kingdom. Gospel of the kingdom was a gospel of repentance. That's similar. In order to inaugurate Christ's kingdom. But it was rejected and postponed. Wow. And so... The gospel that's presented all through the book of Acts and all the way into, in fact, the disciples were still struggling with understanding themselves, right? That's why they kept going to the Jews first. All right. So um, it's interesting that um, Paul, while he's on this topic in 1 Corinthians 15 of the gospel, what is the gospel? It has to do with the resurrection. He doesn't stop there because he ends up in, and he finishes the chapter with some very interesting verses. This I say then, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit... Well, there, 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 he talks about the kingdom of God. There we go. But wait a minute. He says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Well, now, that presents us uh, a challenge, partly because of what we just covered in Matthew 25. Because in Matthew 25, you have the sheep and the goats judgment. And remember, he said to the sheep, those on his right hand, enter into the kingdom. That was the inheritance that they would have. They would enter right into the kingdom. So how is this possible that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God? Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. We shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption, this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So this kind of complicates things a little bit, doesn't it? Now we can look at your chart, or you can look up here. It's a little bit hard to see it up here, that's why I put it for you in the back of your sheet. Because if we understand correctly, and I'm saying if... <laughs> I believe this is right. If we understand correctly, the church age that goes all the way back here, you know, 2,000 years, all the way from the time of, of uh, the day of Pentecost, if in fact the church is raptured away right here as per what we'll look at in a moment, 1 Thessalonians 5 as well as 1 Corinthians 15, if in fact the church is caught up to be with the Lord in the air, 
and spends this seven-year period with the Lord in the air in heaven, if indeed that happens and that's during that seven-year period we have a time of tribulation or as Daniel puts it in Daniel chapter 9, the time of Jacob's trouble, right? And, and it's a time of, of separating out Israel, those who believe and those who don't. And it's a time when you have the seals, judgment, uh, seals actually are not judgments in my opinion, the, the trumpet, those are little trumpets, believe it or not, and then the bowls, those are judgments. To me, the seals are not judgment. We'll talk about that some other day. And the Antichrist comes, or no, he establishes, he, he comes actually, he's, he's known at the beginning, because in First Thessalonians, actually 2 Thessalonians, it says that he, he won't be known until we're, until we're removed, the church is removed. And then at the midpoint of the tribulation period, he will, the, the abomination of desolation, this referred to in Daniel the prophet, that Jesus referred to in Matthew 24, He'll establish himself on a throne, so he'll betray the trust that the Jewish people put in him. He'll put himself on the, on the, in the temple, and the Jewish people will suddenly realize they've been betrayed. I know there's a lot of information that's complicated, but hang in there. And, and if all of this takes place, whoops, back up, forward. So what is, what is being referred to when it says that the, the sheep and the goats judgment and that they will go into the kingdom. Well, if the 144,000 are ministering during this time, and there are Gentiles who come to put their faith in the gospel of the kingdom, that the kingdom is still coming, they, put, they receive that message. If they survive to the end, then at the end, when the king comes in his glory, which is at the end of the seven-year period, the king comes in his glory, the ones on his right hand will be ushered into the kingdom. They'll inherit the kingdom. And the kingdom will begin at that point. The Jewish people who survive, it says all of the, all Israel will be saved, Paul says in Romans uh, 11. That's interesting. So the ones who, and, and Zechariah says, they'll look on him whom they've pierced. And suddenly there'll be great mourning in Israel. They'll realize, you're kidding. For 2,000 years we missed our Messiah? So then the, the Gentile nations, those who survived during this horrific period on earth and who put their faith in Yeshua as the Messiah, the coming king, will enter into and inherit the, the literal earthly millennial kingdom. So how then can Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 say flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God? Because Paul is writing to a church. And everyone in Corinth at that time or in any church up until the time of the rapture, cannot inherit the kingdom of God by going in in the, in the bone. Because we will be raptured away before. So if we're, we either die, get old and die, or whatever, by whatever means, or if we're here at the time when the rapture happens, we'll be caught away, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So that statement makes perfectly good sense when you consider the audience being uh, the church that he's writing to. He's writing to the church in Corinth and he's explaining these things. It makes perfectly good sense, all right? What am I missing? What, are, is this making sense? If you have questions, feel free to shout them out, okay? Uh, go ahead, Lindsay. Um, I'm not going to address that right now. That's coming. But, you're, but yes, that, that will be after the one... Th he'll be bound at the beginning of the 1,000-year period, and he'll be released at the end of the 1,000-year period. And that's only found in Revelation chapter 21. Uh, no, 20. Revelation chapter 20. Yeah, verses 1, yeah, one 2, and 3... So he'll be bound for a thousand years, which is, which is one of the really interesting passages that premillennialists use to say, we can't be in the kingdom. There's, is there any possible way that we look at the world and say Satan is bound right now? Because the kingdom, during the kingdom period, he's bound. And they say, well, it's not a literal 1,000 year period, um, even though it's said six times in seven verses there. Um, but the fact of Satan being bound during that time I just is 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 a bridge way too far for me to cross.
Because there, to me, this does not look like a time in which Jesus is reigning and Satan is bound. But that will happen during the millennial period, that 1,000-year period, and it's referred to in Isaiah that the, the animals won't even be dangerous anymore. So it's like, it's like the, the effects of the curse are reversed. And, and so that's why Jesus, looking forward to it, said, preach the gospel kingdom and go out and heal everybody. Oh, that was a picture looking forward to what would take place during that millennial kingdom. Okay, So, um, so yeah, Matthew 25, flesh and blood will inherit the kingdom, but they're the flesh and blood that have lived on the earth and survived the tribulation period and put their faith in Yeshua. They aren't us. We could not possibly inherit the kingdom of flesh and blood like we are now because we're either going to, be, we're either going to die or be raptured. So the two statements make sense. Yes, Wayne? That's, that, I mean, that's, that really kind of hits, hits a home run on, on the disciples and the Jews that are thinking that Christ has come to establish the kingdom and we will stay like we are and we'll be a part of it and, you know, it'll all be going. He said, no, you, you guys don't really understand. Right. You're right. You're either going to die or you will be changed. Yes. It, it's not, you, know, you won't be who you are today right. coming into that kingdom. Yeah. Well, you know, many times in Scripture, you, if you take... Again, if you take a passage here and you, don't, and you fail to understand the context and who's being addressed and you force it to mean something over here, you're going to miss the point. Um, it's just like Jesus telling the disciples, uh, don't take anything with you, go out, go only to the lost tribes of the house of Israel. And yet later in his ministry, he said, okay, now go ahead and sell what you have and buy a sword. How do you put those two things together? It's because at the early part, he was telling them to go out and proclaim the gospel of the kingdom until the kingdom was rejected, the king was rejected. Now he says, okay, that's off. It wasn't that it was a plan B. He knew all along what would happen. But the gospel had to be legitimately offered to the Jewish nation, the gospel of the kingdom, and they legitimately re rejected it. Let's just finish by looking. Yeah, Barry? Yes. Yeah. Okay. No, I think that I think that the idea, from what I, the, the the best I can understand it, is the people will still be judged based on how they dealt with the the servants of the king. In other words, the, the 144,000 are out preaching the gospel. People will be judged individually because there will be people from every tribe and tongue, nation going into the kingdom. We know from some of the kingdom passages in the Old Testament, there's many different nations are are represented in the kingdom. How they get there. So there's individuals, and, and, and also um, uh, a couple of the battles that take place, like the Battle of Armageddon, it sounds like the whole world gets wiped out when they come against Jerusalem. Well, the, the army did, but obviously nobody sends 100% of their nation to go fight a war. In other words, they have people back home, right? So, so the, but the idea of the, of the judgment of the nations is that this is not the Jews, we're not talking about the Jews here. We're talking about the nations. They're going to stand before the king at that point, and the king's going to say, you guys are going in. It's not nation by nation as much as it is based on how did you treat my servants. Does that make sense? Yeah, it may not satisfy entirely, but yes, Paul. Yes. Correct. They, they will inherit the kingdom. You remember, remember when Jesus took them up to Mount of Transfiguration? He said, there are some of you standing here that will, will, will see the kingdom before you die, right? And, well, that's interesting. You know, how, how, so what does that mean? Well, then what happened? He goes up to Mount of Transfiguration and they see Moses and Elijah and Jesus transfigured. They see Jesus in his glory. And so... Most scholars, of course, dispensationalists will say, well, yeah, Jesus gave them a, a view of what the kingdom, uh, a little precursor of the kingdom at that moment, right? So it wasn't that they would stay alive until the kingdom happened. It was just that they would see that, they, that precursor. Okay, I want us just to run quickly to 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 uh, to 18. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. 
For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, see, there's the gospel that was presented to the, to the Gentile nations. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Sleep, common euphemism for death. God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by, will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So, this passage is describing an event that will happen that Paul's saying, look, don't be upset if some of the people that you love who put their faith in, in Jesus have died. That doesn't mean they're missing anything. They're going to be fine. They're still going to... They're still going to but what's going to happen? The Lord's going to come and we're going to be caught up to be with the Lord. And those who, he, he kind of, it's kind of interesting the way he puts it because he talks about these people coming back with the Lord and he talks about them going before us. Well, how's that possible? Because their body will be resurrected and transformed and they're going to have a reunion. Their spirit with their body. Okay? So, at the, at the present time, when a Christian dies, he leaves his body behind. So the body doesn't go with us. That doesn't mean we're going to spend all eternity as disembodied spirits. That's temporary. And that's what Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians 15. And that's what he refers to again here in this passage. Okay? The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel. Now, Dr. Sproul. Um, makes the interesting observation. They says, well, now these premillennial, pre-trib rapture people have this funny idea that here the Lord comes and we'll be caught up to meet him in the air and then turn around and go back to heaven. He says, that's not right. And he uses the analogy of the Roman conquering generals coming into, Ro into Rome and they would come and they would camp outside the city and the city would prepare an arch for them, a triumphal arch. And then Many people would go out to meet them and then come in with the, the conquering general into the city, uh, triumphing with them. And he says, see, that's the example of, of what this will be like. There's only one problem. There's nowhere in the New Testament that uses the analogy of the Roman emperor or the Roman general coming back into the city as an analogy of what will happen at Christ's return. But we do have Jesus making use of an analogy of the, of the, of the Galilean wedding. wedding. Okay? Jesus uh, used the wedding ceremony as an analogy of his coming. And remember in John chapter 14, it seems like he says, um, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Oh... It's not the Roman general coming this way. It is coming to get his bride and take her back to heaven. Now, that'll only be temporary. That'll only be for seven years. Okay? And then we will come back and reign with Christ on earth. And I believe that our everlasting existence will be on a new heaven and a new earth. We are not going to be disembodied spirits forever. Okay? And uh, next week, Lord willing, we'll finally get to the church metaphors because the metaphor has changed. The emphasis on the kingdom and us being subjects of the king suddenly loses importance in the rest of the New Testament, in the epistles. And we have other metaphors used for the church, emphasized. And so that also becomes interesting. Anybody have a final question or objection or observation? Yes, Paul. Yeah, disembodied spirits. Oh. able to distinguish the various tongues and groups of different people in heaven if they were disembodied. Oh, I don't think he needed to see their body to know which are, where they were from. I think, I, and again, he's not singling out individual nations. He's just... Well, he says, I, I saw people from every tongue and nation there. Sure. 
So that's that would just. Yeah, I would just say it's by divine revelation that God makes that clear to him. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, we know they we know they left their bodies behind. So I don't know if uh, the shape of your eyes goes with you in your spirit or not. I, I just don't know. See, I didn't even talk about the color of our skin, because us us white guys, man, we are the bane of, of civilization. <laughs> We're the reason our whole world's in collapse, us white guys. <laughs> All right, any other observation, question? Anyway, I hope this has been helpful. I, for me, the, the looking carefully at the terms used and where they're used, by whom, why does John never once mention the gospel of the kingdom? Because by the time he wrote, I think all the disciples had finally come to realize Jerusalem has fallen, the... Uh, the temple is no more. That's not where it's at. We're, we're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection, our forgiveness, our eternal life. It's a different message. Okay? All right, all right. Be back in 10.